When you combine the dream come true of being a dad with the dream to be of entrepreneurship, you're presented with a world of possibilities along with a world of challenges. Join Joel Lewis as he interviews successful entrepreneur dads sharing how they made it work from the start. This is Startup Dad HQ. Hey, hey, welcome to Startup Dad Headquarters. Uh, this is Joel Lewis, and I am the host. And at Startup Dad Headquarters, we're exploring the intersection between fatherhood, entrepreneurship, and life with the ultimate vision of inspiring one small business launch every single day by fathers everywhere. And today, I'm very excited to invite onto the show Tim Grawl. Tim Grawl is a husband, father, and founder of OutThink, a firm that helps authors build their platform connect with readers, and sell more books. He is the author of Your First 1,000 Copies, a step-by-step -step guide to marketing your book, and works with many of the top authors of the wor world, including Hugh Howey, Daniel Pink, Dan and Chip Heth, Barbara Corcoran, and many more. He has launched multiple New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling books through his work with over 100 authors across all, across all genres, Tim has learned and practiced the secrets behind successful marketing campaigns and teaches the strategies and, tech, and techniques through his website, outthinkgroup.com. So that's a little bit about Tim. Let's go ahead and bring him in and have him tell us a little bit more about who he is and what he has going on. Hey, Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Joel. I've been looking forward to it. Awesome, awesome. So, Tim, as you know, this is Startup Dad Headquarters, so we are all about family and, of course, to showcase amazing startup dads like yourself. I, I, recently I, I was recently inspired um, by a quote which goes, no other success can compensate for failure in the home, and I, f and I felt that it would be a perfect setup uh, into the first segment of the show, which I like to call Family First. Uh, now, I ask all the guests to submit a family fun picture, and yours, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, before, we, before we started broadcasting, is, is awesome, and, and it's definitely my, my best photo so far. So let's, let's bring that photo up, and uh, I'll have you break it down a little bit and tell us what's going on in this photo. Uh, maybe share a little bit about your family. You don't have to give us the, the names and everything. I know some folks are, are not too comfortable with that, but you know, let us know what's going on in this in this fam in this photo and your beautiful family. <laughs> well, uh, this was actually last year at Halloween. So um, my uh, my sons like to dress up as their comic book characters, and so they had their Batman and Robin outfits, and so uh, we decided to just go all in on the Halloween thing. And I actually. Um, I used to have an even thicker beard than I do now. But I just I shaved it all off just to do this Halloween, and it was so different that my mother-in-law came over and she was standing next to me, and she didn't recognize me because the beard was gone. And so I felt like I really encapsulated the Riddler thing. Nobody knew who I was. But um, no, so we just dressed up for Halloween for Halloween party, and uh, we had a good time. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, you have a you have a beautiful family, and and thank you for for sharing that uh, that photo with us. Yeah. All right, Tim. So at this point, you've shared with us uh, uh, you shared with us uh, what's current. What's you know? We talked about your bio. We talked about your business. We talked a little bit about your family uh, and what you got going on right now from a business side and, and your family side. And thank you for sharing that with us. Now, this being start of that, we have to take it back to the start. I like to refer to this as the E True Hollywood segment of our show. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Lao Tzu, which goes, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Now, Tim, take us back to the beginning and share with us the, the initial steps of your startup dad journey. Well, I, um, I you know, graduated college, and I actually got married um, in my senior year of college. So uh, Candace, my wife, and I will be celebrating 13 years coming up here in a few months. Wow, and congratulations. So, thanks. And so after college, I, you know, had a couple jobs, and I hated those jobs. And 
you know, they just weren't going well, and I so I kind of started something on the side and was trying to grow it, and then three months after my first son was born, um, I actually quit my job to start working for myself full-time, and Candace uh, was staying home with, with uh, our son. So um, it was one of these kind of like prima donna, you know, you know, forget this, I'm not doing this anymore, and um, I'm going to do it on my own. And so I just was, you know, I was doing several different things and trying to make money and figure out exactly what I was doing for a business. But I felt like one of the things that we, um, you know, Candace and I obviously talked a lot about this decision. And one of the decisions that we made is that um, the business would never rule my life. And so uh, every day I would come home at 5 o'clock, whether you know, I felt like I could or not, and we'd have dinner together, and we'd spend time together, and then once my son was in bed, if I need to get work done, I'd stay up late and get it done, but mm. that, you know, that from like five o'clock until bedtime was this sacred time where I didn't work, um, and we, and that's held, that's held true, you know, every day I go home at five o'clock, whether I'm done or not, and if I've got to get more work done, I just stay up late and get it done, um, and so there were these rules, you know, what I found is that if you set up these rules early on of like how you want to live your life, how you want to run your business, and just force yourself to live inside of those rules, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're able to do it. You know, you're able to constrain it and make sure it gets done and realize that the stuff that you don't get done, it's not the end of the world. And so, um, you know, a lot of people take this stance that like, okay, well, in the beginning, I'm going to work, you know, 70, 80 hour weeks to get everything done. And then once I build it, I'll be able to scale back. And what people find is there's always more to be done. There's always more to do. There's never a point where you're like, okay, I don't have to do anything anymore. I can start working 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is it's important to make those decisions early and force yourself to live inside of those constraints. Nice, nice. So wait, Tim, are you saying the four-hour work week is not uh, is not valid? <laughs> well, actually, you know, I think a lot of the ideas in the four-hour work week are good ideas. You know, the problem with the book is that it's kind of a quasi walkthrough. You know, like the the way he lays it out that it works, it's only going to work for a certain number of people. Mm -hmm. But starting to think through some of the things, like his theory of constraints, the whole like, you know, the, the time allotted to it, you know, a task will expand to fit the time allotted to it, like that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Learning to delegate things is true. You know, learning to um, continue to look for ways to do things more efficiently, to say no to things, you know, his whole, I've, it's been a while since I've read it, but, you know, I think he runs you through an exercise of like, what if you have a heart attack and you're your doctor says you can only work four hours a week, you know, what would you do? Right. And so um, I think those things are important, and I think um, they're valid. And I have. I've been able to continue to cut back, um, you know, like now I only work four days a week, and I homeschool my kids there in, there in the week. And so I'm able to, like, continue to cut back because I have learned to delegate and have learned a lot of those things. Um, so I think the four-hour work week title is a misnomer. In fact, like most people that read it aren't going to be able to work four hours a week, but I do think some of the principles in it are true and have helped me a lot in the decisions I've made. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the, one of the big things that we've done is uh, we've, we've, we've gotten a maid, uh, which has helped, you know, tremendously with freeing up some of the time. And it's, you know, when you look at the total cost and the, the, the kind of the time time versus uh, cost uh, scenario, you know, it, it, it makes so much sense that we were able to do that. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I felt like my dad did is he felt like he had to do everything. And, you know, saving $20 was worth spending hours of time, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of, I am willing to spend money to save time, um, you know, when, when it's prudent. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always choosing freedom over money. And I think, you know, that kind of thing. And I think guilt holds people back a lot of times too. You know, like, oh, well, you know, who am I to think I could get a maid? You know, what is that saying about me as a person? You know, when really it's like, well, it's true. I have more 
important things to do than clean my house and I have the finances to do this and it frees me up to get more done and spend more time with my family then it's worth it so I think um, I think you know that is the way to look at it is like you know I'm always choosing freedom over money freedom over fame freedom over anything else you know if I can get more freedom in my business and still do a good job and still continue to grow it I'm gonna take that opportunity yeah absolutely so Tim like like everything else in life there's always a catalyst that forces one to go beyond what he or she originally thought was possible what was your catalyst and how did it propel you to take that leap well you know there's there's no one there's there's always like different points where you take leaps you know so if we're talking about the original quit my job the catalyst was basically like I hated my job and so I'm <laughs> gonna quit and um, you know looking back I probably would have done it different and because uh, one of my clients is Pam Slim and she always says you know uh, uh, hating your job is not a business plan right. and so that's important to remember and so a lot of times when people ask me about like when I quit my job and how I quit my job to start my own business I'm like don't do it like me because I ran into a lot of hard times because I quit too soon mm -hmm. um, but there's been other catalysts you know there's just been times where um, you know back when my son was in my first son was in kindergarten um, my wife decided to homeschool Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, well, you know, I really want to do like science stuff with him. So you know what? I'm going to take off Fridays um, and do school with him on Fridays. And so this was a pretty like big deal to go from a five day work week to a four day work week. And um, but it was just this thing of like my my son's at home. He's only going to be this age one time, and um, and I'm just going to do this and see what happens, you know. And so that was the catalyst of him just being that age and being at home instead of in school and it was a way for me to spend time with him and um, that that I couldn't do otherwise so there's always these little catalysts where I'm just always looking at like what's the best use of my time um, when can I get more done? You know, I've been, it's 7.30 right now in the morning, and I've been at my desk since 5.30. So, um, you know, so it's those kind of things of, like, if I can get up earlier, that frees me up so I can spend more time with them later. And so um, I think, you know, I try not to wait for these big, like, haunting life moments to show me, like, I need to change. I'm always constantly open to mm -hmm. change, open to suggestions, open to trying something new, because almost any decision we make, we can go back on if it's a bad decision. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, if I started taking off Fridays and it was just a horrible decision, I could just start working Fridays again. It's not the end of the world. And so, you know, it's, I feel like most people, if they can just pay attention, always be open to change, always be open to suggestions, have people speaking into their life. You know, my wife and I are constantly discussing, you know, my work and what I'm doing with the kids and what, you know, we're doing and like constantly making sure that we're making good decisions. Um, and I listen to her. So there's always these moments where she's like, you need to do something different and we'll have those <laughs> discussions and, you know, and I'll try something different. So, um, so there's always, you know, I feel like a catalyst for change, if you're open to change, it should be a constant thing. It should be a constant finding something that's not working and using that to get you to make a, make a change in your life. Nice. Awesome. Now, you, you talked about decisions, and there's a powerful quote by Will Smith that goes, just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide, and then from, at, from that point, the universe is going to get out of your way. Share with us where you were, what was your thought process, and how you finally made the decision to pursue your dreams, and of course, the million-dollar question, how did you approach the subject with your wife? Well, um, with my wife, she's always been... Um, she's always been very supportive, but in a way where she's like, look, you know, you're a responsible guy, Paying our bills is your responsibility, um, and we both agreed on that. And so she's just like, you know, if I'm going to trust that what you're doing is what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And um, and so really, when I quit, when I told her I wanted to quit, she's just like, all right, do you feel like you know you can be successful? And I said, yeah. She's like, all right, go ahead. 
you know, wow. and um, so there wasn't like, you know, actually most of the tough conversations came where, you know, again, I feel like I quit too young, I was too immature, I didn't have a solid business plan, and about probably a year and a half after, she did sit me down and say, look, you need to figure out how to make more money or you need to go back and get a job. It mm -hmm. wasn't a like, okay, this isn't working, go get a job, I'm scared, but it was just like, you need to follow through on your responsibility, which is providing, and you're not doing that the way that you should. And um, so it's not like she just lets me, you know, do whatever, but um, but she's just trusting in me, and that and that alone gives me confidence. Mm. You know, that alone I feel like okay, I can do this because she feels like I can do this, and so there wasn't a lot of convincing. Um, there's, um, you know, she's she's more of a. Um, like uh, I'm making a big change in the business right now, and I'm doing a, I'm starting to do some things differently. And she's the first person I told about it. She's the first person I discussed with it. She knows my flaws, so she knows when I'm doing things for the wrong reason, or I'm doing things, or I'm pushing things when I should let them go. And so I just constantly keep an open dialogue with her about things, and she really helps me kind of stay on the right track. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have a pretty, you know, again I'm coming back to this like. Um, there's not usually these giant moments because from day to day we're kind of just moving along and staying on the same track and she knew long before I quit that that was where I was going so when I finally was like alright I think it's time she's like okay go for it you know so um, so you know it's always been kind of this relationship where she just trusts that I'm gonna take care of things and until I'm not taking care of things she pretty much just lets me go yeah, yeah, and you said this was three months after your your son was born. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. She sounds. She's. It's, can, is it Candice? You said. Candice. Yeah, yeah. yeah wow, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she really is, and um, and just the you know the older we've both gotten, um, you know, the more I've just learned to trust her. You know, she sees things in a way that um. I just don't see. And again, she knows my flaws. So she knows when I'm like making decisions for the wrong reasons or, or those kind of things and she'll just she'll point them out to me um, and help me see those. And I've really learned to trust her where so you know, there's been times where she's like, Look, you need to do this and I don't know why, I think she's wrong, but I'll do it anyway because I mm -hmm. trust her and lo and behold it, it proves out to be right. So um yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm super blessed to have Candace. She she really is that person that that, you know, not only just assumes I can do whatever I put my mind to, but she's also there to make sure that um that I'm doing it for the right reasons and making good decisions. Nice. Nice. Yeah, you know, I I you know, throughout the interviews that I've had, you know, I've gotten the same theme where the wife, you know, for for those entrepreneur dads who who are kind of keeping their wives engaged and, and, and having those discussions, you know, they're finding that their wife is actually a really good barometer as to, hey, should I make this decision? Should I not make this decision? And even though they don't know fully what's going on with the business, you know, they're still able to give some really good advice um, to, to at least think about. Um, so, it's yeah, it's awesome that you're saying pretty much the, the same thing here. Yeah, and I think what's so important is it's not – she doesn't need to understand every aspect of you know marketing or business or anything. What she knows is me, and you know mm. we've spent you know fifteen years together, and so nobody knows when nobody knows um, my again my flaws, um, my my hopes and my dreams and what I really want out of life. You know, there's been times where like I'm making decisions. You know, I say okay, I make all my decisions based on freedom, but I don't always do that I want to always do that but there's mm -hmm. times where I'm doing something because it'll make me be cooler it will make me seem cool or like or um, this could make me a ton of money and she, you know that's when she's like there to remind me like look this is your principles these are what you actually want so don't mm -hmm. go down this path that's not going to get you what you actually want because it has that short term you know she's that person and I you know and so she's that person that kind of keeps it so I don't think she needs to know business. In fact, 
it would probably be a detriment. She she knows, you know. There's other people that know business that I can get advice from. There's nobody that knows me the way that she does. Nice, nice. Yeah, behind behind every powerful man is a powerful woman, right? Yeah, more powerful. <laughs> more powerful. <That's laughs> awesome. So Tim, at this point, there's a startup dad ready to take flight. He's motivated by your amazing story and and wants to take action, but still not sure where to start. Share with us some of the actions you took to turn your vision into reality. So the first thing I think every person needs is a good mentor or business coach. Um, you can read every book, you can um, you know read all the blogs, listen to all the podcasts, and I do, and I get a ton out of those. But there's nothing that can replace somebody um, with with. Um, good knowledge and good experience looking at your situation and giving you specific advice about what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, for the first like three years of my business, I just floundered. Um, I couldn't get my act together. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, you know, I just, you know, the constant highs and lows of money coming in, the no money coming in, and it, it was a mess. And it was because I was trying to do it myself, and I and you know I would read books and I'd make a little better decisions. But when I hired a business coach, and every week I had to get on the phone with him, and he spoke into my business. He could answer specific questions. He could help me figure out how to make better decisions. Um, that is when things really started to turn around for me. And so whether you hire a business coach and pay him, and trust me, when I started paying my business coach, I did not have the money that I was spending on it. You know, um, but it was totally worth it. Um, or get a mentor, somebody that is invested in you, and you know that's going to meet with you once a week, or once every couple weeks, or once a month, and um, that you can really ask questions from and get advice. And there's somebody that you can be open and honest with. You know. Um, uh, you know, good business coach is part business coach, but also part therapist. You know, and like telling you it's going to be okay. You know, you know, it seems like everything's awful, but you know, let's make some good decisions now, and, and it'll turn out all right. And um, and so that's that's the first thing. If I could go back to the very beginning mm. when I quit, I would have I would have hired a business coach on day one. Mm. Um, that would have saved a bunch of just floundering that I did for three years because there's so many things you don't know you don't know about running a business. So um, so that's the first advice. The other is to not be in a huge hurry. So I had a friend that had a job that he hated, but he stayed at it. And on the side, he slowly grew his business, slowly grew his business. And what it did is it forced him to be extremely efficient with his business because he had a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And he did not quit his job until his business more than replaced his salary. And then when he went to his boss and said, hey, you know, I'm going to quit and I'm going to do my own thing, they negotiated with him that if he still came in one day a week, they'd give him half his salary. Wow. So wow. now – he took this business that he was running on the side like 15, 20 hours a week. Think about that. He was only working mm -hmm. 15, 20 hours a week to run this business that was making more than he was making at his job. And then he cut his work week down to one day a week from five and was still making half of that salary. Wow. You compare that to me who was barely making <laughs> ends meet when I, when I quit and like a year later was barely making ends meet. You know, I wish I had waited, kept my job, and grown it more slowly and been more patient and learned along the way. I think I would have been better off as far as, like, quitting. And so there's this idea that goes around, and I see it online sometimes, of, like, burn the ships. You know, just quit your job, and that will force you to be successful. And I'm like, that is stressful. And, again, if you have kids, if you have a wife, like, you know, like, that is – beyond stressful and what it does is it causes you to make decisions that you wouldn't normally make. You'll take that contract because you need the money even though you know mm. it's going to be a bad contract. You know, you'll take that customer, you'll sell that product, you'll you'll slash your prices, you'll discount, you won't charge enough. You make all these bad decisions because you're looking at your bank account and it has four dollars in it. Where if you're able to slow down, build something slowly on the side when you're able to finally quit your job, you now have a business that's super efficient because you've been able to do it on the side. You're only working on it maybe 10 to 20 hours a week. And now you have a business that can actually support you. you if you're putting um, – another friend of mine 
as he grew his side business, he only mm -hmm. lived off his income from his job. So every dollar he made on the side business, he just kept dumping it in savings. And then mm. once that business got to like 80% of his salary, he quit, and he was able to then ramp up his business to over 100%, but he had this huge amount of money just sitting in the bank in case something went wrong. Right, right. You know, so um, so those are the right ways to do it. So again, I don't usually tell people, when I tell people this is how I did it, I usually <laughs> say, but don't do it this way. There's right. other ways to do it. Um but yeah, getting a business mentor, somebody that can speak into it on a regular basis, um, that made the biggest difference for me, and it still does. Like I still have mentors. Um, two days ago, like a bunch of stuff was happening in the business. I didn't know what to do. I got on the phone with the guy, and he was able to walk me through making good decisions, making sure I wasn't making irrational decisions, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so you know, I'll have that when I'm 60 and running my business. All right. There will always be things that I can't see that somebody else will be able to speak into. Now, how do, how do you find a mentor or a business? I know a business coach, you could just you know go online and you could say, okay, I'm going to pay this person somewhere around $1,000 uh, for a session or something like that. But how did you make the decision to find the business coach? And you know, like you said, you, you, were, you were struggling to begin with and you, you said, hey, I need to... to to make this investment, it's a smart investment. How do you, how did you make the decision to pick this person and invest your money, and then how did you find them? How do you find your mentors? So um, the guy I worked with, he was, um, I had met him through some friends, and um, I had known him already for about six months. And mm -hmm. so when I finally reached the breaking point where I'm like, I need help, I just, he's the first person that popped in my head, um, and I trusted him based on just you know, my interactions with them. Um, you know, the way that I think you should go about finding it is asking. Like, it's just the whole referral system. It's like if you need a web developer, you shouldn't go to Odesk and find a web developer. You should ask friends of yours of web developers they know because they're going to refer somebody that you can probably trust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's how I kind of do every – when I look for new people to hire, new people to work with, um, you know, new companies. Um, I always just ask my friends, you know, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Do you know anybody? And lo and behold, somebody knows somebody, you know. Um, so I would say if you're looking to hire a business coach and if you have the money, the thing with mentors is that um, they get busy and you end up usually feeling bad asking them. Like, you know, unless you know them well enough or they're willing to commit, you know, it's it, I, I would feel bad saying, hey, meet me every Tuesday at noon for coffee, no matter what, you mm -hmm. know. And so and what I've found with mentors is they kind of come and go because they get busy. You know, they're not that invested. But when you're paying somebody, you're paying them to show up and serve you. And so I, you know, I would email my business coach all through the week when I had questions, I'd call him because I knew I was paying him and that's what I was paying him for. Mm. So if you can at all afford it, I, I recommend finding a, a, a good business coach that you can pay to give you advice. Um, otherwise, a mentor does work well. Um, and again, like I'm not paying a business coach now. I've just kind of surrounded myself with a half dozen other people that I can kind of call on to give advice. Um, and again, that's just meeting people, asking people for referrals. Um, you know, if you're, you know, if I run a consulting business, you know, I would just ask my business friends, you know, do you know any other consultants that, you know, are doing a good job that you think, um, you know, I could connect with? And, you know, do an email intro and you'll at least get one phone call. And then you can talk about, like, hey, you know, is this something we could do on a regular basis? Um, so most of the time I would just say ask around. Um, and again, even if you're hiring a business coach, don't just go online and Google business coach and hire somebody. Like, you know, ask people, ask around, you know, do some research, look at your LinkedIn, people you're connected to on LinkedIn, and, um, and find somebody that you think can speak into your business. Nice, nice. Tim, what's something that inspires you to keep moving forward? You know, I think it comes down to um, a friend of mine. He says, um, he says the way that you find your mission is to see where there's injustice in the world and then work to fix it. Nice. And 
you know, there's injustices that I work on in my personal life, you know, like, you know, the poor and, you know, human trafficking and that kind of stuff. But I think um, it applies in business as well. You know, when I started working with authors, it was because I loved authors and I looked around at authors and everything that was changing in publishing and none of them knew how to do marketing. And I knew how to do marketing. And I thought, that is so wrong that these authors that are writing these fantastic books, they're not getting to the hands of readers because they don't know how to do marketing. And so that was an injustice, and I'm working to fix it. Um, and this, in a new business that I'm working on now, it's the same idea. I, I see an injustice in the way things are being done, and I'm working to fix it. And so I think that, um, you know, there's a level of like I work because I need to feed my family, and I care about my kids, and I care about my wife. But like. What really you know drives me when I'm sitting at my desk is the fact that I feel like I've started a business that is making an impact in people's lives, mm -hmm. and it doesn't you know there's this you know there's this constant tension between like making money and making a difference, and a lot of people feel like they can't be the same, and um, I feel like they can only be the same because the only way I'm able to help more authors is if I can make money helping authors otherwise I gotta go find something else to do and so um, you know what keeps me going is just you know I personally love authors I love reading I love the way that they impact the world and so the fact that I get to be a part of getting their work more out to the world um, is an awesome job to me and um, and so you know there is that kind of crossroads between you know a lot of people talk about their passion and mm -hmm. but when a lot of times when people hear passion they hear the word hobby um, you know like I'm passionate about mountain biking or I'm passionate about you know uh, knitting you know and then they try to create a business around that and sometimes it works but most of the time it's gonna fail and I like that I like that thinking of like where is there an injustice that I can work to fix um, and that I can be a part of making positive change. So it's not like, um, you know, I'm passionate about, you know, like I love marketing. I think it's interesting, but I don't like do it on the weekends like I ride my bike on the weekends. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, but, you know, I do look at like, okay, this is something that needs to be fixed and I can be a part of fixing that and that's a good thing. And so that's that's how I kind of stay focused and, and look at constantly what's next. It keeps me at the edge of things because there's always better ways to do things. Um, where I think if people start a business just, you know, I started a business to make money, but what I do to make money isn't, you know, isn't driven just by money. It's driven because I want to make a change in the world. And I think if you do something just because you think it'll make a lot of money, it's a it's a tricky thing that has several bad endings. Nice, awesome. So, uh, all right, Tim. So we're we're just over the halfway point of the show, and we're now entering the segment that I like to call Real Dads real talk. This is probably the most important segment of the show. This is where we go deep and I ask you a series of tough questions that we can't skip over. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Tim, are you ready? <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Now, as a father, husband, and provider, being a self, uh, being self-employed must at times seem a bit scary like you've talked about, and we know failure is always lurking around the corner. Can you share with us a time when either failure, doubt, or fears almost made you give up, and how did you overcome that? So there's two um, there's two specific times where I look at this. Uh, the one I've alluded to, and I'll go a little deeper into it now. Um, there was a time about a year and a half after I quit my business where I came home, and we put the kids down. I think we only had one at the time. Mm -hmm. And my wife sat me down and she said, you need to either figure out how to make more money or you need to go get a job. And I, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. But that was this moment when like I obviously had failed in some way because she shouldn't have to have that conversation with me. And so that was embarrassing, um, and I knew it. I knew it wasn't working. I knew what I was doing wasn't working, but I wasn't willing to admit it until she sat me down and said that. And um, and I had that choice to make. And actually, the next month, so that was a September, 
um, the following month, um, we didn't have enough. In the, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to pay our mortgage. So I actually had to ask my parents to send me a check. But I was able to, that next month, to quadruple my income. Now, I didn't wasn't making all that much, so quadrupling wasn't like I was rolling in money. Right. But I still actually have that check from my parents, and this was mm -hmm. you know six years ago now, uh, that I never had to I never had to cash because I was able to bring in enough money. Nice. Um, but there was that moment where like if I didn't fix something in the next thirty days, I need to go get a job. And um, and I don't remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be able to do this. It was just really this like something has to change, and I've got to figure out what's going to change. Um, but that was probably the worst moment for me as a man to have my wife sit me down and say something's got to change. You're not doing what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then about uh, five-ish years ago was when I, right before I hired my business coach, I basically had like a nervous breakdown. Like I broke all the blood vessels in my forehead and my eyes. Like like I was just like breaking down because I felt like no matter what I did, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was at a point where I was like, I something has to change because I can't live like this. Like I was paying the bills, I was making enough money, but it was like killing me. And um, and so that was when like I called up my the the guy that was my business coach and was like, look, you know, I need your help because if I don't change something, this is I'm just gonna shut this down and go home. And um, and that was that point where it was like I was willing to just stop. You know, if mm -hmm. this, you know, I couldn't live like this. The whole point of starting a business was to have freedom to do something that I enjoyed, and and all of that, and all of that was just breaking down underneath me. And so, um, but you know, my whole thing is like, um, I'm just going to keep going until it really just fails. And you know, I still the thought of going back and getting a job was just so abhorrent to me that I was just going to try one more time. And I think there's been so many of those times where I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to try one more time, you know, yeah, and yeah. okay, it's bad again, but I'm going to try one more time. And, um, but, you know, it, it, it always has been um, where now I'm at a place where, like, I have enough going on. I'm, I'm not scared of the failure that will put me back in a job. Yeah. Um, but that's relatively recent. But I w I've always been, like, if it reaches that point, you know, I'll go get a job because the most important thing is providing for my family. But um, there have been those moments where, you know, I was ready to just be like, this sucks. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> nice. Now, one of the biggest fears and limiters keeping dads from starting their own business is private health insurance. Can you share with us what you do for coverage or some, or some suggestions? Um, I just pay for it. I just buy it and pay for it. Um, I feel like for me, um, if I if my business got to the point where I couldn't provide health insurance, I'd go get a job that would provide health insurance because I feel like that's one of those, for me, um, that's not a negotiable item. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so I, I just make enough money and it's on my list of things I got to pay every month. So that um, that goes back to kind of my original thing, which is like, don't quit until you're ready. Don't quit until you have enough money. If if giving up your health insurance to quit your job and you have young kids, um, don't do it. Uh, you mm -hmm. need to stick with your job for a little while longer until you can make enough money that you'll actually cover it. And I know it's expensive. Mine keeps going up just like everybody else's. And I'm in that percentage of people that's really getting screwed by all the changes. Um, mm -hmm. But I just pay for it. It's To me, it's um, like I've got to pay for my mortgage and like my food and then health insurance. Those are like mm -hmm. the non-negotiables. So... Um, so I feel like, I don't know, I just look at it as like something I've got to pay every month, so I pay it every month. Nice. So when you when the dad is, uh, startup dad is thinking about potentially you know, quitting their job, they should look at their runway and they should also factor in 
the cost of health insurance before taking that leap is what you're saying. Yeah, and what I've done, I mean, I don't know how technical we want to get, but like I have an HSA plan that has a really high deductible. So, um, but I have enough money and savings that I can cover that deductible, and that keeps my cost down. And right. I've I've ratcheted that deductible up over the years. So I started it. Um, I think like 2400 and now I'm at like 70 something hundred and so and that that every time I ratchet it up my cost comes down I mean of course it incrementally goes back up but right. um but I think like that's a good decision because if you you know if you get a even if you don't have like 5 grand sitting in the bank if you get a 5 grand you know my thing is like I'm not worried about my kids getting a cold I'm worried about my kids getting like really sick and needing prescriptions mm -hmm. for the next 3 years or needing major surgery or you know me you know wrecking something and like needing surgery like those are the things that you want health insurance for it's like yeah you know so we pretty much pay out of pocket for like any of the small stuff if you know we got to go get medicine or we got to go you know my kid got a splinter that got infected you know we just went and we just paid for that out of pocket um, but I for me having um, insurance for anything major happening that's a non-negotiable like if if something happens and like you know it destroys me financially just because my kid needed surgery for something like that's that's not good and that's very possible so um, for me you know if it was just me on my own I would consider not having health insurance but when I'm talking about four people that are in my care including myself mm -hmm. um, I just find the best option I can that that takes care of the the like you know the major things and um, and again it's a non-negotiable if I ever got to a point where I had to cut health insurance to continue paying my bills I'd go get a job yeah Nice. Um, so if you had to do it all over again, would you and why? Absolutely. Um, so this morning, um, so a typical morning, Monday through Thursday for me, is I, I get up at 4 a.m., I do my reading, um, I do my own like personal meditations, and then I go work out at 5.30. Um, and then at 6:45, I come into my office because I actually work like two work out two blocks from here. And sure. then um, at about 8:30, I leave my office, I go home, and I spend the next two and a half hours homeschooling my kids. And then I come back to the office and I work till about five o'clock, and then I go home for the night. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't work Fridays. So. You know, if you look at my typical work schedule, if you add in like at night when I check email and, you know, I'll do some stuff on the weekends here and there, I probably work about 32 hours a week, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so the amount of time I get to spend with my kids is enormous. Like, you know, I get to, I get to spend time with them in the morning. I get to spend time with them in the evenings. If, you know, like when we travel, it's pretty easy for me to take off and go. Um, so... You know, I look at this short period of time that my kids are in my life. You know, um, Connor, my oldest, he's going to turn nine in January. That means he's halfway out of my house. Yeah. So there's this period of time where um, if I miss it, it's just gone. And so I, you know, I started homeschooling last year. And it was really stressful because, <laughs> like, it's this major chunk out of the middle of my day, um, and it mean that's when I started getting up at four o'clock in the morning, you know, and that's hard and stressful and like keeps me on the edge of being sick because I'm not getting enough sleep, you know, but I don't think I'll ever look back at this time and think, wow, I wish I would have worked more, you know, mm -hmm. and. There is no job. There's very few jobs out there that would provide me this much freedom to spend time with my kids and be there for them and do things um, that in a, in the way that I have by running my own business. So there's been extremely hard times. There's been um, there's been times I didn't think it would make it, like we've talked about. Uh, there's yeah. been stressful times. Um, there's been times where I wasn't making enough money, um, but. I would do it again because all of those things could still happen with like a normal job. You know, I have friends that get laid off, you know, like that stuff happens. And so um, I would absolutely do it again. Um, 
I would do it a little different, but I would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, okay, we're, we're at the final segment of the show. I like to call this the handyman segment. Uh, this is where we quickly reach into your toolbox, and you provide the Startup Dad community with some really useful tools um, for them to use. You ready to rock? Yes. All right. What is your number one time management hack or tool? Um, number one time management hack or tool. Well, so probably a kind of snarky, unrealistic answer is I have employees. So um, I hired my first employee about f almost six years ago, and now I have three. Mm -hmm. And so they do um, uh, like probably – they do all the work that I can't do and I don't want to do. Right. And so that provides me a lot of freedom because um, I don't have to do that stuff anymore. So that's one. Uh, the other, like if we're just talking about a tool, it's my I, my favorite thing is my MacBook Air. Um, I have an 11-inch MacBook Air, has everything on it I need, and I can take it anywhere. You know, I'm, it's always with me. And mm. so that gives me that freedom of like... Um, I'm out somewhere, or I'm on vacation, or you know, pretty much if I can find a Wi-Fi spot, I can get some work done. So that gives me that freedom to kind of disappear because if I need to reappear back on the grid, I can pretty easily. So, um, you know, I think that you know, I switched from a desktop a long time ago, and then I got rid of my MacBook Pro, and I just wanted the smallest, lightest computer I could have, so I would just always have it with me. Um, so that, you know, gives me a lot of freedom to uh, work from anywhere, um, and so I can nice. disappear and reappear pretty quickly if I need to. Nice. What, what's one personal habit that you believe attributes to your success as a father, husband, and entrepreneur? Um systematizing everything I possibly can. Um, so anything that I can, anything I find myself doing more than once uh, over and over, uh, I try to find a system. So I'll create a checklist, I'll outsource it to somebody, um, you know, I'll uh, find a more efficient way to do it, I'll figure out, you know, how to get a computer to help me do that. I mean, even down to like, I used a, a, this software called Text Expander. Yeah. That lets me, you know, I found myself writing the same emails over and over. So I just, you know, it creates a shortcut for these long emails and I just type it and it's done. So I'm just constantly looking for any kind of fluff in my schedule that's not doing something for me and just cut it out. Um, so, you know, when I'm at work, like I'm working and I'm getting a lot done and I'm trying to be extremely efficient because I only work X amount of hours a week. Um, so, and then I just have a very tight schedule. You know, I already, I already gave you my schedule, but from 4 a.m. till 5 p.m., like I know, you know, you, know, you ask me what time of day, I'll just tell you what I'm doing. And, um, and so I just try to be extremely efficient, um, cut out anything, any distractions like social media or um, phone calls as much as I can, or um, you know if I feel like you know I, I won't even come into the office because I might get distracted by my coworkers. You know, like mm -hmm. I you know I will sacrifice when it's time to work, I'll sacrifice fun and pleasure to get work done so that I can do that stuff later in the way I actually want to. Um, so, you know, that I think is the thing that's helped me to continue to, to grow and thrive even as I continue to cut down how much actual hours I'm working because I get more done in those 30 hours I'm working than most people get done in three weeks sitting nice. at their desk. So I would say get really, really good at creating systems and be efficient in your work and be very honest with yourself when you're wasting time and cut that crap out and you, what you'll have left is an extremely efficient work day that lets you go home early. Nice. What, what's one book every startup dad should read? Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman. Um, that, it's the like primer for business. So, you know, have you heard that quote by Donald Rumsfeld of like, there's the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns? Have you heard this? No, I've never heard okay. it. Okay, so there's known knowns. There's things that we know that we know, right? Mm -hmm. There's known unknowns. There's things we know that we don't know. 
-hmm. Those are fine. Both of those are safe because we know things. The, the actual k things that kill us are the unknown unknowns, the things mm -hmm. we don't know that we don't know. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah, in yeah. business, if like I, w I went to school to be a programmer, so I was trained to sit in a cubicle and churn out computer code. I had no idea how to run a business. There were so many things that I didn't even know about. And his book, Personal MBA, basically goes like business idea by business idea, set up into like five sections or something. And it just it like there were so many things when I read it where I'm like I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, and so you're not going to come away from it with a step by step guide on how to do X, but you'll come away knowing what you need to learn. You know, knowing the places where you've like, not, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, and so many people are getting into business now because they know how to do one thing well. They know how to do marketing. They know how to be a programmer. They know how to do sales. You know, they know how to do one thing. But when you're running your own business, there's a million things you have to know. And this helps you identify what those things are. So every everybody should read, every person in business should read the personal MBA. The personal MBA, awesome. Definitely will have, to have that in the show notes. All right, Tim. So this is the final question, and it's a little bit longer than, than the other questions. So uh, just take a minute, and then uh, give us the best answer you could you could think of. So on the other side of this broadcast is a dad who, at this point, is fired up and ready to go. But as soon as this broadcast is over, he will put down his mobile device or close his computer, and life is going to happen by the, by next and by next week, he will find himself right back in the day to day minutia of things. What would you say to that dad to inspire him beyond this broadcast? So I think the first thing you have to start with is a vision of where you're going. Um, and it has to be bigger than I just want to work for myself or I want to make a lot of money. Um, it has to be this thing that um, that will get you up in the morning. You know, and so... Once you have that, once you have that reason you're getting up in the morning, things become a lot easier. So um, I I really hate getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Like <laughs> every time my alarm goes off at four a.m., I'm like, oh my god, that night went so fast. You know, right. like. But I have a vision of the kind of life I want to have and the kind of dad I want to be, and that is a big enough driver for me to get up at four o'clock in the morning. So people are missing is that clear vision on exactly why they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, you know, I have people that work for me and they love their job and it gets them up in the morning and they don't want to do anything else because they love their job and they love working for me. And so, and it, it lets them have the kind of life that they want to have. Mm -hmm. And so that's what keeps them motivated to keep coming into work and doing their thing. So it's independent of working for yourself. You have to understand you know the kind of life you want to have and what your goals are and what your vision is for all of this stuff and then once you have that you need to get a couple other things next first is humility um, nothing thrills me more um, I've gotten to the point where nothing thrills me more than somebody pointing out a flaw because that is something I can fix and that is something I can become better at if you are worried about people seeing your flaws and you're going to defend yourself against them, you're not ready yet. Because mm -hmm. building a business is such a, um, um, I don't know how to put it. It, it, it exposes you in a way that um, 
you just have to have humility and be ready to learn and be ready for people to speak and invite people to speak in and point out your flaws. Um, the other is that's very closely related is you have to be ready to be extremely honest with yourself. Um, most of my mistakes, most of the things I've, that have held me back is I haven't been honest about myself. I haven't been honest about how crappy my business idea is. I haven't been honest with myself about the fact that I'm being lazy and wasting a lot of time. Um, it's important to to go into it with that vision and and willing to sacrifice yourself and your ego and who you think you are and um, for that bigger vision. Um, and people do this all the time. You know, they have this, you know, this is why people go off to war and this is why people, you know, defend their family is there's this vision and they're willing to sacrifice anything for, for it. Mm -hmm. And so once you have that, you have to be willing to just lay everything on that altar. You know, so... Um, this business is not about my ego. This business is not about me getting rich. This business is not about me, um, you know, puffing myself up or doing something cool or, you know, having something cool to tell, you know, my high school friends, you know, that I do. It's about, you know, I want to create a business that makes a difference in the world and provides for my family and allows me time to spend with my children. And if it meets those things, I will do I'll do anything that's not ethical that's not unethical or immoral. Mm -hmm. um, and so I get really nervous when I talk to people that want to start their own business because they think it would be cool or they think it will be fun or um or they think it will be easy. Um so if you are like okay and so what? So back to your question. I kind of got off the rails there. No, no, once, once you have that, other things begin to fall in place. So if I speak to a lot of people um, that are in that place where they say they want to start a business, but then life gets in the way, if I actually look at their life, here's what I'm going to find. A lot of TV watching, a lot of getting up late, a lot of uh, spending a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter, a lot of spending time on hobbies, a lot of going out for drinks with their friends, um, a lot of you know things that um, aren't bad. You know, I don't think it's bad to watch TV. I watch TV in the evenings. I don't think it's bad to do these things. But what you're, you can tell me, I want to start a business and I want to start something on the side and it's really important to me, but I can see what's actually important to you by your life. Mm -hmm. So if you're not willing to sacrifice these things for starting your own business, that means you haven't gotten a vision yet. That's why I say you have to start with a vision of this better life because that is why you'll get up early. That is why instead of watching TV, you'll get work done. That is why instead of going out with friends, you'll stay home and get work done. Um, you know, that is what will drive those things. So, um, so I think, you know, in the... There is this idea of like life gets in the way and I know everybody's busy, but I don't even like that word busy. What you should say is I haven't prioritized that. You know, and there are things that like I'm too busy to do because I have more but it's always because I feel like I have more important things to do. You know, I could work in the yeah. evenings, but it's more important that I hang out with my wife. You right, know. Right. So so you have to understand every time you make a decision about how you spend your time, you're, you're saying with your life what your priorities are. So, again, I quit, my I quit my job and started my business when my youngest son was two and a half months old and my wife wasn't working. Um, I had a vision of where I was going and I cut a lot of stuff out of my life. If you look at my life right now, besides working out, I have basically no hobbies because I have other more important things to do and I can do hobbies when my kids are gone. And so um, so I would say you need to be, if, if somebody's asking me like, well, life gets in the way and I can't start a business, it's like, what are you prioritizing over it? If you don't know how to do something, go out and learn how to do it. On Amazon.com for 10 to $15, you can learn basically anything. 
Right. You know, um, okay, you you um, you're too busy. Okay, well, what time do you get up in the morning? How much you know? How much TV are you watching? Okay. Um, well, you know, I don't have a good business idea. Okay, business ideas are a dime a dozen. Go out and find one. Look for ways that you know. Look, you know, find people that teach you how to find business ideas. That's out there too. You know, if you once you get a vision for what you want and become ruthless about, I'm going to get there no matter what. Like your Will Smith quote, all of a sudden everything falls into place. Right. You know, it's all out there. But honestly, if I'm being like brutal about this, most people that say that they don't actually want it. They want to want it. They mm -hmm. want the life I have now. They don't want the last eight years though, because most of that eight years was like really hard and really right. scary. And mm -hmm. so they say they want it, but they don't actually want it. Because once you want something, you go after it. You know, mm -hmm. like once you decide this is really important, you know, hell or high water, it's going to happen. And so that's why when people talk to me about wanting to start a business, I want to know why they want to start a business. I want to know what kind of change they want to see in their life. And I want to know how bad they want it. And the truth is most people probably shouldn't start a business because they don't actually want it bad enough and mm -hmm. it's not a good fit for them. Again, I have employees and they love working for me and they probably would be very unhappy running their own business. And so you have to be brutally honest with yourself um, and be willing to make those tough decisions and be willing to cut all of the flack and crap and fluff out of your life so you actually have room to do something new. Awesome. Awesome. So find your vision. What's your why? Mm -hmm. Be focused and honed in on making that, that vision come a reality. Yep. Awesome. Awesome, Tim. So this interview was amazing and awesome as I knew it would be. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I want to give you, I know we're, we're over time now. I want to give you a chance to, you know, tell the folks where they could find you. Uh, you know what you have got, you know, what, what you have going on. It's almost eight thirty. I know you got to go homeschool, homeschool <laughs> your, your kids. So, <laughs> yeah, Joel. Um, they can find me at outthinkgroup.com. Um, I have a free newsletter there, a free thirty day course that you can sign up for to learn about building your platform and selling books. Um, and, uh, and then my book, like you mentioned, is your first one thousand copies. It's available on Amazon. Yes, one first. I got it right here. Hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for your time. This was an amazing interview. Uh, and you, you be blessed and have a great week. All right. You too. Thanks, Joel. No problem. Hey, startup dads, take the next step right now and download your free guide called Nine Apps Every Startup Dad Should Have in His Toolbox. It's only available at StartupDadHQ.com slash free gift. Again, that's StartupDadHQ.com slash free gift. So go download it now, and we'll see you next time on Startup Dad HQ.